we have this first statement over here, okay? Math is useless in my life. Yeah. Now, I, maybe useless is a strong word, but maybe we don't need to understand absolutely everything about it. Maybe it's just not relevant on, on, a, on a conscious level. So why is this wrong? Yeah, so I, I think as you say, right, nobody would say, oh, we should just abolish math altogether, but the tendency is to think, oh, I don't need to do anything with this. Why would you? Yeah, what's um, wrong with that? Yeah, I don't go around calculating stuff all the time either. Um, <laughs> Do you not see the world in matrix code? No, exactly. Okay. <laughs> For some people, reason people keep asking me this, like, oh, do you see algorithms everywhere? No, <laughs> they're not there. So why would you need them? I mean, you're pr probably living perfectly happy lives without math whatsoever. And a calculator isn't going to directly improve your life either. Um, I think there are some nice books on this. So Brian Christian's uh, Algorithms to Live By has like a nice set of actual calculations that you could be doing to make decisions differently or better. But most of the time, it's not going to make much of a difference. Yeah, cool. That's the myth. All right, we're right? done. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> <laughs> We've had it. No. Uh, at the same time, and this is something you guys have all been hearing the last day and a half, we're using math in so many places now. AI is essentially just a lot of math, but there's numbers everywhere these days in performance reports about if you're paying attention during your lessons, uh, which people are getting analyzed these days. Are you actually looking at your teacher, especially when you're on a Teams call? Um, in sustainability numbers, in politics, polling, there are numbers everywhere, and there's a really good reason why they're everywhere, because the world has gotten really complex at a very, very large scale, and we need to somehow grapple with this difficulty. So what do we do? We get numbers in there to make things simpler, to quantify things, to get a, an overview of, okay, what's going on? And as a result, suddenly all of you guys are confronted with all these numbers, all these places where math is being used to make decisions about your life, about whether you get treatment or not, which is something which I think we'll talk about a bit more in a, right. in a second, um, about whether you'll get hired for a job. There is math in lots and lots of places. And so it becomes really important not necessarily to do the calculations yourself, but to be able to be critical about this. Are we actually using it in the right way? Are we doing the right kind of things with this math? Is all this decision making, which is suddenly happening in terms of numbers rather than in terms of people talking together, really going off in the right direction. Yeah, but even if we understand the fact that math is involved in hiring processes, in the workplace, in universities, and in place of education, even if we understand the fact that math is there, which I think we all do, why do we need to actually like dig in and get into it and uh, familiarize ourselves with those processes? Like, isn't it okay to just do our just thing? Lie back and not do anything? Yeah. I'm, not, well, I'm not talking about being like a sloth or yeah. being lazy about it or being ignorant, but just like, don't have the capacity to internalize absolutely everything that's going on. No, absolutely. So why should math be one of those things that we internalize? Yeah, and I, I think this goes back to the idea that it's not necessarily about you doing all of these calculations, learning all of this math, but getting the right kind of mindset around, okay, what's going on here? Where are these numbers coming from? Uh, and when should you disagree with those numbers? So let's take an example. And uh, uh, right now, in a lot of countries across the world, uh, people are using uh, quality-adjusted life years as a measure for whether a treatment is going to make your life better, yes or no. They have long surveys. They try to calculate, OK, how effectively is this going to be improving your life? And in places like the Netherlands, the government has decided to say, oh, well, uh, one year of your life is worth 80,000 euros. That's it. You're not allowed to get treatment paid for by the government if it's more than 80,000 euros per year of your life. And they've measured whether something will improve your life, yes or no, based on surveys. There's lots of stuff going on behind that number, whether your life is going to be improved. But these are really high-stakes decisions that we're making now with exactly that bit of math. Well, uh, how many people in the Netherlands are actually aware of, of this? and? how uh, kind of controlled their, their healthcare is on this level. Is there mass awareness about this? Not necessarily, no, just a little bit. Um, it was done during COVID initially when the government thought, oh, we should do a rational calculation on whether we want to have lockdowns or we just let lots of people die. Just vibe, man. Yeah. <laughs> 
like, oh, it's fine. Uh, and and uh, according to the, the math in this case, it was supposed to be just fine too. Oh, let's let COVID wreak havoc. Lots of people will die, but in terms of the hard numbers, it won't be as bad as all these people locked up in their house and losing economic value as it right. were. Fortunately, the government very quickly decided that, okay, maybe numbers isn't the right way to think about this. So they didn't go through with this, but they had all the calculations there. They were ready to actually make the call. Well, well, yeah, I, I do remember in the early stages of the lockdown that the Netherlands was pretty slow yeah. to, to actually lock down. Um, yeah, okay, I'm, I, I guess I'm fairly convinced. <laughs> so math is not useless in your life, and by just being aware of the, the processes where it affects your day-to-day -day life in terms of healthcare, education, everything, it's, it's exactly. worth knowing what's actually going on behind the scene. Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, the, the impact is so massive and it's getting bigger and bigger now that the world is getting more complex and we need all this math to, take, to get a handle on it, yeah. that it helps to be aware of, okay, wh how is all this decision making happening? Oh, fair enough. Great. Well, I think we're ready to smash this myth. <laughs> um, give me a second. Ugh. <laughs> I feel like Harley Quinn. <laughs> all right, this myth is smashed. <laughs> okay. Now, this, <laughs> this statement, you can't argue with math. Yeah. Math is one of the most rational things in the world. Mm -hmm. Most people would say that, yeah, the numbers say this, there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer. The, the appeal of math to a lot of people is that it's, it's pretty cut and dry and it's very clear, it's pretty consistent. Yeah, it's clean, right? I mean, if right. I were to start selling you guys on the idea that one plus one is three, you wouldn't take me seriously for more than 10 seconds. I'd ask them to take your PhD back. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, so there's no, there's no changing the calculations. And in that sense, sure, there's no way in which you can argue with the fact that someone said, oh, I put in these numbers and I did all the math. And then at the end, we got to a conclusion. The, where it gets tricky is that as soon as we start applying all this mathematics, right, all the one plus one equals two, there are a lot of questions, okay, which numbers are you going to choose? Where are they coming from? And what are you doing with all those numbers? And that goes in the same direction as the bit that you don't necessarily need to know all of the math that goes on in the middle. But the parts in the beginning where we select, okay, if we're going to make lots of healthcare decisions based on a number, how are we creating this number? What are we actually going to measure? We have the same thing uh, earlier this morning. One of the speakers was here on stage saying, oh, we need growth. Sure, sounds great. We need to, the number to go bigger. But, but what kind of growth do you want? What kind of increase, right? What are you going to include there? Are you going to include parts about sustainability? If so, okay, how are we going to measure this? Which parts are we going to include there again? Is it just CO2 out, uh, emissions that we're going to measure? Okay, that's fine. But you make a lot of those kinds of decisions about what you think matters at the moment when you start applying mathematics. Well, I mean, companies would say, you know, we grew sales by 17% year on year. Uh, and that's a pretty clear metric. That's a pretty clear KPI. Sure. Uh, and so they could say, we grew by 17% based on sales figures. So what's wrong with that? Why, where's the argument? Well, so the companies will say that and we can say, oh yeah, I mean, this is clearly what matters to you guys. Partly, you can get a lot of situations where companies will then grow no matter what, right? Um, there was this massive scandal in the US of pharma companies exactly focusing on the growth of sales for uh, painkillers. And the way in which they grew their sales was by getting everyone addicted to painkillers. Yeah. Are you telling me that pharma companies are sometimes unethical? Surprise, right? <laughs> you, you come here for the real big <laughs> revelations. <laughs> No, but, but the, 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 the question still there is, okay, which number are we focusing on? Um, to give a slightly different example also f from the healthcare industry in this case, in the US, uh, large insurance companies for uh, years decided to measure uh, how bad your illness was by looking at how much money they were spending on you as a patient. Mm. So there would be a, a risk score, a number they calculated based on how much was being spent on all your medical issues. 
And if the risk score was high enough, then you would get all kinds of extra treatment and help refunded by the insurance companies. If it was too low, then you wouldn't get any extra help and you would just have, sort of have to figure things out yourself. It's the US after all. Um, <laughs> the, the problem is they picked, in this case, a very convenient, easy number, right? The healthcare cost. And as a result, for years, you had a massive disparity in how much treatment white patients were getting versus black patients. Because mm. white patients go to expensive private hospitals in the US. They spend massive amounts of money on treatment there. And black patients were living in poorer neighborhoods on average. And they were just getting less expensive treatment. So the algorithm, the, the numbers that they were coming up with, were showing exactly this for the precisely the same healthcare issues, white patients would get twice as high risk scores as black patients. There so was, what does that tell us? Uh, they picked the wrong number, essentially. They were looking at, oh, we're going to look at costs, and they forgot mm. that there was this massive disparity in between, caught by this number, and then they thought, oh, let's make all these kinds of weird decisions based on uh, a, a number that reflects inequalities. So you get the same thing here. Um, whether it doesn't necessarily mean that the math in between is the problem, it's just the choice of the number, how we're measuring this, and then what we're doing it with it, that makes a really big difference. Uh, you're reminding me of something that I heard recently. It said that a fact in itself is meaningless. It's a story you use that fact to tell that matters. Exactly, and in this case too, uh, behind all these numbers, there, there's a story there. What are we doing with this? And there's a story at the beginning, there's also something to be said about, okay, the number at the end, what can we actually decide with that? Um, for the last couple of years as well, we've been using, or companies have been using AI systems to do job interviews. So there is a good chance that the next time you guys are doing a job interview, you're sitting behind your laptop recording a video of yourself, and then there's not going to be a person looking at it, but there's just going to be a computer there calculating whether you are a good fit for the company, yes or no. And they don't work. And there's, there's so much that, that, that it doesn't take into account. It doesn't really understand context. There's this claim, oh, yes, well, if you smile, then you must be happy and an outgoing person. And if you frown a little bit, then you must be this annoying colleague that we don't really want. Or you work in finance. Or you work in finance. Maybe <laughs> then you fit in. I, I agree, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good that someone appreciates your jokes. Yeah, I know, right? One person. <laughs> Text me later. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think you've made a really compelling argument yeah. with this. So, once again, this myth is smashed. <laughs> now, this, this one being incorrect, it's far too difficult. That's... That sounds reasonable to me. Like, I'm, I'm really not like a numbers guy. I'm not a yeah. math person. I barely squeaked by when I was <laughs> in high school. I barely passed. And since I left high school, never took another math class. And I've been fine. And it's, it's never really been a problem. You know, so it's far yeah. too difficult. There's, that's, that's, that's fine, right? Why? Yeah, why, why sure. And to be honest, I wasn't that fantastic in math class either. Um, but I think this is partly because schools are doing a really, really good job at making math as, seem as useless as they possibly can. <laughs> right? Every, everywhere you, I go, at least, every, people run into the same issue. Oh, I get all these nonsensical uh, calculations I have to do, and it's completely divorced from anything practical. And the only thing they tell you is, okay, just do the sums and forget about the fact that there's a world out there. <laughs> There's a lot that we can gain there in just the education of, okay, but no, math isn't just necessarily about numbers. What math is doing a lot of the time is it's trying to find patterns that are very much inspired by what's going on in the real world, mm. right? The calculus, which we're all really annoyed by and want to completely forget that it exists, is there because people saw, oh, things are changing in the world and we want to find a way to understand how this change works. Right, we forget that math exists because there were people out there who were just observing the real world and wanted to make sense of it. Yeah, and there's the same thing. Statistics was originally invented because a bunch of aristocrats in France were playing playing games and they wanted to win more often than the other person. <laughs> uh, and so they started inventing a bunch of uh, mathematical ways of figuring out, okay, how does all this probability actually work? And 
math is still being developed for precisely this reason. We see all these patterns out there in the world. We're not going to be capturing them perfectly with math, yeah. but there's an underlying idea behind all of these different fields. And annoyingly enough, school doesn't teach you about them. They just sort of say, oh, here's the formula we came up with at the end. Now go do the actual calculation and, and have fun with it without necessarily understanding what you're doing. And on the other hand, so, so I mean, I think that would already help to make Absolutely, it a bit less difficult. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you don't necessarily need to be able to do all this calculus just to understand or be critical about all these numbers that are, people are using. Um, to give a, a, a more AI-related example, uh, these days we, I think you've all heard about this, AI systems are very discriminatory a lot of the time. Fortunately, we have good ways of making it discriminate less, removing all these biases from the AI systems, but we have to somehow translate into math what it is that we want. Right? So people have said, okay, we can make the system treat people equally, but the question is, okay, what does equality mean here? If we're having a system that's going to decide if you get a loan, yes or no, do we want to give everyone loans equally often and then accept that we're going to give a whole bunch of people loans they can't afford just to reach the right Wait, number? Wait, hold on. So who's talking about this in, in education? Are, are students learning about the implications of math at this kind of level? Because that would have definitely made it more relevant to me. Yeah, yeah not really. Because if we're talking about statistics and odds and stuff, like I used to play a lot of poker when I was in high school. It would have <laughs> been nice to know why. <laughs> why you kept losing. Why I kept yeah. losing, yeah. So many slices of pizza down the toilet. So yeah, no, but people aren't teaching this. And, the, and this is where a lot of the decision making is being made now. So like with the non-discrimination argument, there's a lot of, okay, do we want equal proportions? Do we want equal accuracy? Do we want to prevent pre people from getting mistaken decisions more than the other group? What kind of equality are we actually after? And it's going to be different for different cases. But ultimately, a lot of this has to be translated into, again, math. Right. And that's where I think we want to, together, have an opinion on, OK, we don't want some big company uh, deciding, this is what we're going to enforce upon you guys and then as you just equality. Accept it. Yeah. So you're, you got your PhD in the philosophy of math. What sounds like a solution to you? How can we, how can we get people more on board with this? Where does it start? What does that look like? Yeah, so a lot of what we currently know about how people learn math is based on really young infants, so it's not necessarily representative for the rest of us. But what you see there is exactly the same thing. How do people learn? Well, by toying around in practice, not by doing all these calculations one after the other. I mean, you need to do some of this, uh, oh, just writing everything down, which is annoying, by the way, and I was also really bad at that. <laughs> but this connection back to, okay, what are the ideas behind this math? Why are we actually doing this? What is it trying to tell us about the world? That's completely missing, but that's something that we're, I think, all looking for when you yeah. have this formula, so that it's not just a bunch of weird Greek letters in front of you on a piece of paper, uh, but that it's talking about something meaningful. Well, that makes sense to me. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced, absolutely. Now, Stefan, you're my guest here. So I would like to give you the honor of breaking the last box. It's Great. a little bit heavy, <laughs> so just watch out. Ooh, yeah, two hands. Yeah, it is heavy, right? <laughs> All right, this myth Wonderful. is smashed. Great. Amazing, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Now, give it up for Stefan Boisman, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.